All right, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So this morning we're going to be going into chapter 18 of the book of Acts. We're going into the chapter 18 of the book of Acts. So if you want to go ahead and open up to chapter 18 of Acts, that's where we're going to be. But first we're going to get some music by the band Vesparum. of God. So, without the belt, your armor is not going to stay on. Your armor is going to flop around. It's not going to stay tight. It's not going to hold on. It's not going to do you any good. It's not going to stay up. It's not going to stay on. So, you've got to have the belt first in order to hold all the other pieces of armor together. Let's talk for a second. What is repentance? What really is repentance? is admitting that you did something, okay, and turning away from it, or having a change of heart or a change of mind. It's taking responsibility for those things that you've done, saying, I did this, I'm sorry, I'm going to try to do better, and I'm going to try to rectify the situation. All right. 
So, let me fix the camera real quick. It's a little wonky. There we go. That's a little better anyway. So, let's go ahead and bow our heads and say a prayer. Dear Lord, we just come to you right now, and Lord, we just ask for your peace and your guidance. Lord, we know that there's a lot of, of hurting hearts right now, and Lord, we just ask that, that your peace and understanding come and help heal those hearts. And Lord, we thank you for this message. We thank you for everything that you provide us with. And Lord, we just ask for your strength to continue on throughout the rest of this day. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So I'm going to start this message with a moment of silence. Um, there was a lady that played for the Dallas Warriors hockey team. She was a uh, U.S. Air Force veteran um, who lost her life. Uh, I guess it was Friday night, early Saturday morning. Um, so let's take a, take a quick moment of, of silence for that. All right, so <clears throat> we're going to be in chapter 18 today, chapter 18 of the book of Acts. So when we get into chapter 18, we've already had the Areopagus address. We've had him going to Athens. We've had them going through all that. And it says, it starts out and it says, after this, he left Athens and went to Corinth, where he found a Jewish man made named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come to Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. So we've got a lot of things in that one little statement there. We've got Paul, he left Athens, he goes to Corinth, he confines a, a, a man and wife named Priscilla and Aquila, and they're in, in Corinth because Claudius, the emperor of Rome, had told all of the Jews that they had to leave Rome. So there's a lot of conflicting things here. The Jews and the Romans aren't, as we have stated before, the Jews and the Romans weren't really seeing eye to eye on certain things, yet they were still, some of the Jews that were trying to persecute Paul were using Roman law to try to persecute a Christian that was upsetting the Jews. So there's, there's this, this big, you know, conflicting areas of interest here. And he meets this man and his wife named, you know, I said named Priscilla and Aquila. Usually it's, it's it, uh, the reason I say Priscilla and Aquila is usually her name is listed first. In this, in this case, his name is listed first. But in most cases, as we read through, Priscilla's name will actually be mentioned first. And they're a married couple who are going to help Paul in the ministry. And they're, they are a couple, and everywhere they go, every time that they're mentioned... Their names are together. They are together. They come together as one as they're going through this. So, Paul came to them, and being of the same occupation, stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. Now, I want to stop there for a second because there's been some uh, debate and confusion whenever it says that Paul was a tent maker. I've heard one person in particular say that, oh, well, that just means leather worker. Well, that's not really the case. Did they sometimes make tents out of leather? Yes, sometimes. But there's a difference between a leather worker making, you know, leather pants or leather jerkins or, or different things like that, clothing made out of leather or different props or, or different pieces of furniture or and things like that. There's a difference between that and what you do as a tent maker. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to look first in the Wycliffe version and then in the Tyndale to give what they have to say because those are some of the oldest English translations that we have. So let's start with the Wycliffe. Got one right here. And 
if we go down to verse 3, and for he was of the same craft, and he dwelled with them, and worked, and they were of rope makers and craft. So it's saying that there were there were rope makers in the in the Wycliffe, which is kind of weird in that. So we have that they were of the same trade, and it says in the in the Wycliffe that he worked with them and he dwelt with them, and they were work make, rope makers in craft. Let's see what the Tyndale has to say on that as well. I've got one right here, so let's see what the Tyndale has to say on that in verse 3. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and he wrought. Their craft was to make tents. Their craft was to make tents. So they were tent makers, but Paul worked with them, and the interesting part about that, and what I really want you to get from that, is that Paul was working while he was doing the ministry. He worked with them everywhere he went, and he makes a very large deal of that later on in his letters, whenever people are accusing him of going into this ministry to make money. He says, I didn't take a single dime from you. My hands worked alongside with everyone. He was not going into ministry and going around to these different towns and expecting them to just pay him. He was working with them. He was putting in the work. His hands were working with them. So, verse 4. So he, he goes and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. So he goes to the synagogues every Sabbath, just like everywhere else that he's been. He goes every Sabbath day and tries to persuade both the Jews and the Greeks. So he's speaking to both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia... Paul was occupied with preaching the message and solemnly testified to the Jews that, that, that Jesus is the Messiah. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook his robe and told them, Your blood is on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So he's in the Sabbath, he's trying to convince the Jews and the Greeks, and the Jews are still saying no, and they start blaspheming against Jesus. They start saying that Jesus is not the Messiah, they start saying all these different things, and Paul shakes his robe at them, which is a sign that I don't want any of your dirtiness on me, I'm done with you, and he says, I'm now going to preach only to the Gentiles. I've tried with you. What you're doing is on your head. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and you still resist. You've heard the truth. You know the truth. You resist the truth and you blaspheme against the truth. I'm done with you. I have to move on. And he goes and he starts preaching to the Gentiles. So he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justice, a worshiper of God whose house was next door to the synagogue. Right next door. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed the Lord along with his whole household. So you've got a leader of the synagogue. So it's not all of the Jews in there. Crispus was a leader of the synagogue, and he believed the Lord along with his whole household. Many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed and were baptized. So many of the Corinthians, when they heard this, they believed and were baptized. So even though the Jews were trying to stop it and trying to shut it up and, and resisting and blaspheming, many of the people still believed and were baptized. And we go through that a lot every day as we try to preach the word, as we try to go through spreading the gospel. We're going to meet resistance like that. We're going to have different things come up. But we've got to keep going because we don't know who that is going to reach. Then the Lord said to Paul in a night vision. So he's, he has a, a, a vision while he's, 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 he's asleep, most likely. He has a vision of the Lord talking to him and telling him, Do not be afraid, 
but keep on speaking and don't be silent, for I am with you, and no one will lay a, lay a hand on you to hurt you, because I have many people in this city. And he stayed there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So keep this in mind. When, whenever he's going and he shakes his robe at the Jews and says, I'm done with you, I'm going to talk to, to the Gentiles, there's still some Jews that are following, such as the leader of the synagogue. And it's after this point that he has this vision of Jesus speaking to him and telling him, don't be afraid. No one's going to hurt you because I have many people in this city. There's many people here that are my children. There's many people here that are going to start following the right way. There's many people here that are going to start listening to you. You keep doing your work. I will protect you because you're doing my will. That's what it breaks down to right there is you are doing what I want you to do, so I'm going to protect you. No one's going to hurt you here. Think of all the other stuff that Paul had been through at this point. All the other beatings, all the other things that he went through, was he still doing God's will? Yes. Yes, he was. But in this particular case right here, Jesus says, this is what I want you to do. Don't be discouraged. I know the things that you've gone through before. I know the different things that you've been through before. I'm going to protect you because you're doing my will right here. I know you're discouraged. I know you've been through a lot. Keep doing what you're doing. I know all the things that you've been through. I know you're, you're, you're discouraged. I know that there's things that are, that are hurting you. I know that the, the, you're, a lot of times you're probably thinking that this isn't, this isn't going well. Then why should I keep going? What's the point? All of us have those different thoughts at some point. And here, Jesus is speaking directly to Paul and says, keep going. Don't be silent. Keep doing what you're doing. I'm with you. Sometimes we all need to go and hear that voice and hear that, that I'm with you. Keep going. Don't be silent. Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing what I want you to do. You're doing good. Don't stop. So this particular passage here really resonates with me and, and hopefully with, with a lot of you as well. Keep going. Don't be silent. Keep doing what the Lord wants you to do and he's going to be with you. So in, uh, in verse 12, while Gallio was, was pro-council of Achaia, the Jews made a, a united attack against Paul and brought him to the judge's bench. So all the Jews get together and they make a united attack against Paul and they drag him in before the judge's bench, before this Gallio. He was the pro-council, which is like a head judge. This man, they said, persuades people to worship God contrary to the law. So they're charging him with persuading people to blaspheme against God, basically. They're, he's teaching people to worship God contrary to what our beliefs say that we should be doing. Uh, and they're trying to say, you go under the law, the, which we have the law, but the law also speaks of Jesus. So it says, as Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of crime, or of moral evil, it would be a more reason it would be reasonable for me to put up with you Jews. But if these are questions about words, names, and your own law, see to it yourselves. I don't want to be a judge of such things. So he drove them from the judge's bench. So he says, Look, you guys are you guys are arguing over semantics. You're over, you're arguing over 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 wording. You're arguing over names and places and things like that. This isn't this isn't a crime. This isn't a moral evil. This isn't something that I want to be a judge over. So figure it out yourselves. I, I, go, and he sends them out. He doesn't want to be a judge over it at all. He doesn't want to be involved in it at all. He says, go, deal with it yourselves. This isn't anything that I can legally, from a legal standpoint, I can't do anything. You're asking me as a legal judge to judge over a dispute amongst you. 
This is this is y'all's dispute, not mine. I can't no. In verse 17, then they all seized so uh, Sothenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the judge's bench. But none of these things concerned Gallio. They dragged the leader of the synagogue before the judge's bench and beat him. And the judge is going, look, I don't know what you're beating him for. I still can't make a ruling in this. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know why you're beating this guy. But that's your own dealings, not mine. I, I, I don't know why you're beating this guy. He didn't run to me. So they're trying to get to Paul. They're trying to get him charged. They're trying to drum up all this different stuff. They're trying to get the Roman judges on their side, even though the Romans have kicked out the Jews, which, again, it goes back to, it's, uh, what are you going to do for me now? What can I twist this with? We've seen this a lot in modern times as well. So in verse uh, 18, so Paul Having stayed on for many days, said goodbye to the brothers and sailed away to Syria. Priscilla and Aquila were with him. Again, see, Priscilla's name first. Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He shaved his head at, at uh, I have a problem with this, with pronouncing this one, Centure, because he had taken a vow. When they reached Ephesus, he left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and engaged in discussion with the Jews. And though they asked him to stay for a long, for a longer time, he declined. But he said goodbye and stated, I'll come back to you again if God wills. Then he set sail from Ephesus. On landing at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and went down to Antioch. So they're back at Antioch. And after spending some time there, he set out traveling through one place after another in the Galatian territory and Phrygia. Strengthening all the disciples. So he's still going around in the area and strengthening the churches. Now we get to another part where we're going to meet somebody else. We're going to meet somebody else, and this one is, is another important one to me. Verse 24. A Jew named Apollos. So we got this Apollo guy. His name's Apollos. A native Alexandrian, so he's Greek. Okay? It says that he's a Jew, but he's a native Alexandrian, which is part of the Greek area. An eloquent man who was powerful in the use of the scriptures arrived in Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spoke and taught the things about Jesus accurately, although he only knew of John's baptism. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. After Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him home and explained the way of God to him more accurately. When he wanted to cross over to Achaia, the brothers wrote to the disciples, urging them to welcome him. After he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating through the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. One of the things I want to point out here, we've got this guy named Apollos, right? He's, a, he's, a, he's eloquent in speech. He's trying, he's doing, he's not doing wrong. He's just not fully informed yet. He doesn't really know yet. He knows a little bit, but he doesn't know all of it. And he's going and he's trying to, and he's trying to, 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 to speak, and he's trying to convince the, the Jews, and he's trying to do what's right, but he doesn't quite know yet. There's a lot of people that have a really good speech. They can speak really eloquently. They have a really nice speech pattern. They can communicate using, using words that, that really resonate with people. But if all you're doing is, is saying really eloquent words and you don't know what it is that you're speaking about, does it matter? No. I would rather be up here being a stumbling fool, stuttering every five words, but actually knowing Jesus 
knowing the material that I'm talking about and appropriately conveying the Bible to you, much like Moses complained about being uh, not eloquent in speech and stuttering, that to be someone that was really eloquent of speech and giving great, eloquent, worded, uh, high IQ speeches and, 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 and this and that and the other, I would much rather be the, the stuttering guy than one that speaks really well but doesn't really know everything about what he's talking about. Especially when you come from a preaching standpoint. Especially when you come from a teaching the Bible standpoint. You also need to look at what happened. How did he get, get more information? How was he handled? Priscilla and Aquila did not get up and just start berating him while he was speaking. They brought this guy over to their house. And it says Priscilla and Aquila. So it was the married couple, Priscilla as well, in ministry. Women in ministry as well. Priscilla and Aquila, as a team, a married team, go to him, say, hey, why don't you come over to my house so we can, so we can talk a little bit. They bring him to their house, and they gently instruct him and on more of what he, what, he, what he was missing. They instruct him a little bit more on the pieces that he was missing so that way it can all come together and make sense. They didn't berate him and tell him he was wrong in the middle of the synagogue while he was arguing. They said, hey, why don't you come over to our house later and we can talk about this and we can, we can share a little bit more information with you. Apollos could have easily said no. This guy is a really eloquent speaking guy. He was he was probably had a really high IQ if he's that eloquent of a speaker. Right? He could have easily said no, or he could have taken offense when somebody tried to correct him, when somebody tried to tell him that he didn't quite have it all right. He could have gotten really arrogant. He could have got letting his ego got in, get in the way. But he goes. And Priscilla and Aquila talk to him. Teach him a little bit more. He's receptive of that. He's receptive of taking, taking on more knowledge, learning more. He's receptive of that. And because he's receptive of that, he goes on to do further things. He even goes, and the brothers write to the main church and say, welcome this guy in. And he's going, and he's greatly debut, de de debating the, the the Jews and speaking on a higher level about Jesus being the Messiah. We have a lot of people that are on TV, on the radio, in different ways that are really eloquent speakers. They're really eloquent. Their 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 wording is really good. They know how to how to how to reach people. They know how to get people to do different things. But are they fully instructed in the, in the Word? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. We have to a lot of times look at this and look at these eloquent speakers. And we have to know the Bible well enough ourselves to know whether this eloquent speaker is actually speaking the truth? Or is he just using pretty words that we want to hear? Are they just using pretty words that we want to hear and saying what our ears want to hear? Or is it what our heart needs to hear? There's a lot of that going on, and the other point is we need to be receptive we need to be receptive when someone comes to try to help help us grow. When someone tries to correct us, we need to be receptive of that if they're right in their correction. We can't let our own egos get in the way to think that we're better than anyone else. And we have to be careful on who we're listening to to know and test it against God's word. Is what you're hearing 
true to God's word. And the only way that you're going to know if an eloquent speaker is true to God's word is you've got to be in God's word yourself. I encourage you every time, I encourage you guys to read the Bible for yourself. The reason, the reason that we do these on Sunday, that we go through a specific book of the Bible, is so that you're reading as well. So that you're reading the word yourselves as well. I don't want you to just listen to me stand up here and say what my opinion is on different things. I want you to read it for yourself. I want you to read the Bible for yourself. I want you to, I encourage you, and I want you to be in the Word yourself. That's why we do the series on Sundays over different books. We've done Luke, we've done James, we've done Jonah. I don't remember what else, what else we've done so far. We're doing Acts right now. That's why we do this on Sundays. So that you're reading along with the exact words that are in the Bible. The exact wording that God used in his Bible. That's why we do this on Sundays. On Friday nights, we have, we have the Friday Night Lights where I talk about a different topic of the week. And I give a sermon on that, and that's more of what you're probably used to seeing in a, in a regular sermon. On Friday nights, I, 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 I get like three or four different scriptures. We talk about a topic. We relate it all in. We use some personal stories and things like that. On Wednesday nights, we do the, the, the Wednesday night Bible study if you wanted to join, if you wanted to come. All of these are designed to hit a different way. The Bible studies are literally just having a conversation about a specific topic, and we can go through many different topics. So I want to hit in different ways, but on Sundays, I want to read specifically the Word of God. That way you are instructed, and you're not like Apollos, that only knows a little bit, and is not fully instructed in the way of the Lord. I want to equip you as much as I can to get equipped by God. Because God equips the called. He doesn't call the equipped. I'm trying to get you into the Word so that God can equip you. So that God can equip you. Because I don't know about you, but stepping out the door anymore, you need to have the armor of God on just to step out your front door. You need to have the armor of God on when you roll out of bed. We've got to have that armor on. And the only way that you're going to get that armor on you is to know God. I'm not going to, I have personal sets of armor myself. And I'm not letting anybody put touch my armor or put on my armor that I don't know. So God's not going to let you put on his armor if he don't know you. And we need that armor. So, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close this one out. If you'll bow your heads with me, please. Dear Lord, we just come to you right now, Lord, and we just, we want to thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for all that you continue to do. Lord, we continue to ask for, for healing. We continue to ask for peace. We continue to ask that you help us understand your will. Lord, we ask for strength and guidance as we continue on through this day and through this rest of this week. Lord, we ask that you just continue to guide every step that we take. That you direct us in what your will is. And Lord, we ask that you protect us as we do your will. We ask that you protect us. Lord, we ask that you let us put on that armor. Lord, we ask that you let us put on that armor to, to help protect us from the different attacks that come our way. And Lord, we just, we thank you for all that you, that you have done. We thank you for setting us free. And we just, we ask for continued strength. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So, <clears throat> I will see you guys Wednesday night. Wednesday night, Wednesday night, Wednesday night. 
All of you are welcome to come here. There's an event that's, that's already up. You're welcome to come by the house. The address is on there. You can come by in person. You can join us online. If you want to join online, uh, the link will be put out. Just click on join the room and you'll be in like a Zoom type meeting. Um, it's been really great. We've had some really great conversations. We've had some really, really deep conversations. So guys, come in person. You can come online. Either way, just, just, just join us. And until then, I love you guys, and I will see you down the road.